Hello and welcome to a very special episode of The Exchange. Today our guest is a person who has endured the worst possible nightmare imaginable. No person should ever have to go through what this lady has experienced, let alone a parent. Rosie Betty's only son, Luke, was 11 when he was murdered by his father. Rosie is determined to not let her child's death be in vain and as a result campaigns against domestic violence. Today, we are extremely grateful to be joined by Rosie Betty. Well, Rosie, thank you so much for joining us on The Exchange today. It's a pleasure. Uh, this program is broadcast, obviously, around other nations as well. And, of course, in Australia, your story is very well known. But for the sake of our viewers in other lands, could you give us uh, a snapshot of what has taken place uh, in your life and your family over the last several months? Um, well, actually, on the 12th of February um, of this year, which seems like yesterday on one level, but so many decades ago on another, my um, son, who was 11, um, was killed at cricket practice. And um, unfortunately, he was killed by his father, and who aimed, who hit him over the head with a cricket bat and, um, and then used a knife. And this was um, just on a normal school night and um, on a normal summer's evening. And you were there at the time, but not in the immediate vicinity? Yes, I, I was there. Um, Greg, we were protected by a fam uh, an intervention order and Greg was allowed to have access to Luke at this type of training and, and fo um, uh, cricket training and, 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 and football. With that had been um, negotiated with the, the court. And um, so it was a normal cricket practice um, with kids and families around and everyone was had had a really great time. It was the Mornington Cup, it was a hot night. And Luke hadn't seen his father for a little while because we'd just recently come back from the UK. And he asked me if he could have a few more minutes um, with his dad alone to practice and, 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 and very quickly a lot of the parents and children dispersed and I at the time felt um, he was safe, I was close by and I saw no problem in him. And I guess as, as a mother being in a public place, mm. the, it's the last thing that you would be thinking of. It was the last thing. As long as I could keep Luke in my eyesight, um, I would have been concerned if Greg had taken him in the car or taken him somewhere. Not that I, at that time, believed Luke to be in danger of Greg. He'd never shown any um, intention to harm Luke. Uh, it was more that um, the intervention order prevented him from doing that and I had reasons to be concerned of Greg's mental health and and I, I wasn't sure how Greg was tracking um, and whether he was depressed and I had reasons to to fear that um, if, if that was to eventuate into a suicide I didn't want Luke to be at risk in mm. that way. So, you know, very clearly I didn't expect it to happen in that type of way, in such a public manner. And um, although I was quite close by, um, my view was obstructed by a toilet block. Wow. So just a little toilet block, I just happened to have I didn't actually see what he did. Did you know immediately that this was not good? Yes, and <clears throat> it's really difficult because obviously um, I'd never been in a situation where it's life or death before. Um, I've certainly never experienced shock and disbelief in the way that you do when you're in such a state of um, panic. Mm. And. I understand more now after time, you know, um, has the police explained to me. And um, so I literally had just um, asked a friend to come over for dinner. I just got off the phone to her, just about to go and get Luke. Um, as I say, I felt I knew exactly where he was. He was in a safe place. 
And all of a sudden I heard a, a, a very kind of loud, anguished wailing sound that um, I immediately knew something was wrong and looked up and saw that it was Greg and he was bending over Luke who was prostrate on the ground and so I knew from the way that Greg had um, emitted this sound that mm. something was terribly wrong and Luke was obviously unconscious and my brain, the sense that my brain made of that was that Luke, Greg had bowled a bowl too fast to Luke and knocked him mm. unconscious. And so I felt I needed to go quickly to get an ambulance and that time was imperative. So I started running towards the clubhouse with my mobile, which was in the opposite you know, direction, realising that Greg would be comforting Luke and making him safe. And it was imperative for me to get an ambulance, so I ran um, and I found myself panicking so that I actually couldn't dial. And I came across another parent who was still there um, with his boys um, and he helped me by calling the ambulance. So even at that point, you did not think that no. Greg had actually killed him? You, you, you thought this was an accident? That's right. I think, um, and so did... The gentleman that was helping me, you know, it's it. That's the logical conclusion mm. because mm. the you, you your brain can only think mm. in what you can make sense of. So, the the actions I was watching or had thought I had seen was that of it being a, a, an accident, and so I continued to run towards the um, car park of the club rooms because. I knew it would be quite difficult for the ambulance to find where to drive and, and locate. So in the midst of total panic, and I was you were still in total thinking. panic, that was my, the thing I could feel that I was able to do that made sense to me. Um, I was still really, I guess, um, you know, you, you do look back and you do wonder why you do certain things, but in in those kind of moments you you're not logical you're not thinking and you don't know what you're doing really but that's what made sense to me and and I think it was sensible you know somebody was Greg I thought was comforting Luke Cameron was um calling the ambulance I was running towards where the ambulance needed to be guided because yeah. I felt that it all you know, when you've got a serious injury, <clears throat> time is critical. Time, yeah. And At then what time mm, did you realise that it was, was had a very shocking. different story? I, I, my friend came uh, because I was really saying, this is bad, this is really, really bad. I know this is really bad. And I, I was too scared. I was really scared about what I was going to have to face with Luke's injury, I was really scared about what they, that might mean, if it was a head injury or something of that nature. And so I was trying to kind of stop my panicking. And so we went, my friend was comforting me and we, we went to, towards the ambulance um, to, to try to work out what was happening and um, at that point, I saw the police aiming a gun at Greg, and I was I, trying to make. I, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea that anything was going wrong, um, and um, I thought because they I knew he needed to be arrested, they were choosing to arrest him then. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, you need to be focusing on Luke. He's injured, not this silly mm. carry on. So that was my first response and um, I was asked to move away and then I heard the shots of Greg being killed or shot. Yeah. And as I said, you know, if, unless you've been in this kind of situation, you really are not yourself. You really are, mm. um, you know, you, your brain is not working. It's not catching up with reality. You're trying to make sense of things. You can't understand things. You know, and, and the same for the police. They arrived thinking it was an accident. Yes. And the next minute they're having to shoot somebody who's coming towards them with a knife and making a quick decision. And, and 
you know, that's not what they had planned to do as well. So, you know, even, and, and the ambulance people, they came again thinking it was an accident and they're greeted with someone who's brandishing a knife and clearly... Very different to what they mm. yeah. were thinking. Backtracking a little bit more, Rosie, what was life like for you uh, when you and Greg were together? Um, tumultuous. I think um, what I would say is that um, it's very difficult to describe a relationship really that's, <laughs> that was so up and down. And, and I would say that, um, you know, I had my own house. I, I worked, I was independent. And Greg was in my life, but he, we didn't live together. And I wouldn't have described him as my partner. I wouldn't have described him as my long-term boyfriend. I would have described him, I, he was somebody that was important to me, that I cared about, that I was attracted to. And I guess at the time, when you look back, I had moved back from Sydney after being away for a few years. I was to, trying to re-establish myself um, and I was living quite in a quite isolated area, which was in Menzies Creek. And so I was feeling a bit lonely and I, I, bumped, I met Greg after um, knowing him several years earlier. And so I was really kind of pleased to reconnect with him. He was, he was funny, he was quirky. Um, he was extremely helpful with me. I'd got a, a property that needed a lot of work, um, a lot of outdoor work um, on acreage. So we worked a lot on that property together and he was great. So there were good times, but you know, there was always, um, tension at times because um, maybe I'm strong-willed or independent and used to my own things my own way and so there would be those clashes but it really you know I, I, I did fall pregnant and I guess you know I was nearly 40 and um, I think that um, I'd reached a point in my life I guess where I felt that you know working having a career and all of those things wasn't quite the same and didn't have the same appeal as it used to have. So when I did fall pregnant, I was really um, excited to be a mum, mm. really excited. And yeah. um, and that's when I suppose the, you know, the, the tension did start because then it's, there are expectations that um, get built into uh, when you're expecting children and um, and, and what part is, is both parents going to play? And does that mean you get married? Does that mean you have a prop, you know, what, what, what does it mm. mean? Yeah. So that was quite confronting um, when I began to understand that Greg's lifestyle, which was that of somebody who's um, probably hasn't, hadn't changed, but, you know, I recognise more now that, um, you know, he's, he, he, he really wasn't, capable of holding down a mm. job. Um, he, it would always end up in um, losing a job and things like that. So I began to understand quite early on that I was going to have um, to take full responsibility for Luke financially and provide for him. Mm. Um, yeah. All right, we'll take a break right now. We'll be back with Rosie and her incredible story right after this. I'm here because of Luke and I'm here because one in three women is affected by family violence. One in four children. Welcome back to The Exchange with our special guest, Rosie Batty. Rosie, tell us a little bit about when things started to actually go wrong. What were some of the signs that things were on the decline? Um, look, I think when you look back, there are, there are certain moments where you feel bitter disappointment and, and real concern. And I guess one point that really stuck out in my mind was when I realised I was pregnant and, and was planning um, for uh, maternity leave and, you know, and purchasing things and, and as you do. And um, I can remember Greg saying to me, if you think I'm going to get a job so you can sit on your fat ass." and do nothing, you've got another thing coming. And I think all I felt at that time was, but I just want to be like my friends. I want to have one year um, maternity leave like they do. I just 
don't want, I just want to have what my friends had, no more, no less. Mm. So that was a big shock to me that he would see it in, in a demeaning way. Do you think he was thinking it was going to take away from his lifestyle? Like he was entitled to a certain I think amount it, of... I think pro probably what it did is highlight his, own, his inadequacies and inability to, to, to contribute and provide um, mm. in, a meaning, in an equal or a meaningful way. I think, and so he projected that onto to me. Um, so I think that um, what it sent a signal to me was, I cannot rely on this person, I can't trust this person, I can't predict that this person is going to be able to help me. I am going to have to do this alone mm. and I will not ex have expectations in the future of this person. So that was a definite turning point for me. And after Luke was born, um, I had come home and, and Greg was helping me with Luke at night time and he was getting up in the night while I was breastfeeding and he was helping change Luke's nappy. And he decided that Luke should sleep with him in the living room because it was warmer and he felt the baby wouldn't wake up as often if that was the case. When the truth of the matter is that a baby wakes up in the night because it's newborn and needs feeding, mm. that's normal. And I wasn't going to let Luke out of my arm's reach. He was going to be in the cradle beside my bed and that's a normal mum's response as a very protective. And um, I'd had a caesarean, so clearly I was um, not very robust and I wasn't very agile. And um, that progressed into an argument in the middle of the night with me having to wrestle Greg as he aimed a big chest that was I used as a coffee table. He was going to throw it into the living room. So that was probably the first display of real aggression mm. and um, an acute anger and starting to use furniture. Um, at that point, and I still, you know, he hadn't hit me and He's, he's so, you know, those, those, were, the, those were triggers. And, and, and that, if Luke, as you know, there were, that's really quite common for pregnancy and children um, to, to um, be real catalysts mm. for, for violent behaviour. Did things kind of spiral down from there, Rosie? So you're saying at that particular point he hadn't touched you personally, but did things progress downwards um, from there? Yeah, look, um, I asked him to leave the next day and so the ha that created a pattern and, and he would come to see Luke. I would need, some, you know, appreciate some help. Um, I would have enthusiasm about him coming to bond with his son and providing, you know, Luke, Greg had control and felt that he was um, doing what he wanted, um, everything was good. But as soon as it was challenged in any way, um, it would escalate. And, and the, th the thing about violence is it continues to escalate. It doesn't go, ever go back to where it started. It uh, continues to escalate. And I, I think that a lot of people don't realise that violence may not be every day. It can be months in between, even years. Mm. Um, and a lot of this violence was intimidation and um, psychological. It, it wasn't physical. Um, and so, you know, I suppose when I also look back, there were lots of about violence that I didn't understand at the time. Um, it seems to me now very evident that um, I would expect most people to know what forms of violence are. Well, let's just maybe let's mm. unpack that a little yeah. bit because I'm thinking about the the person watching right now, and yes. for me, um, this has been such a learning curve as well. What are some of the signs? What are some of the red flags? What are some of the things that you go, no, that is actually not all right, yeah. and that's the beginning of violence. And if you're saying that violence is only going one way, Rosie, we, need to, we need to know these things, yeah. and people need to know these things, because it's not going backwards. No, it, it never goes back, and it does get worse, and it won't ever stop. And I think that's one of the things that is very difficult to understand when you're in the midst of it. Um, it, it starts with, Predominantly, I would suggest it would start with controlling behaviours, um, but very definitely verbal abuse, put-downs, to the point where 
and particularly if you're in a vulnerable position, um, it may be that you've, um, you know, whether it's because you've just had a child or whether it's um, whatever reasons, you've, you've, you're possibly in a vulnerable position. And very quickly, that person um, can twist your self-esteem to the point where you really have lost um, you're very confused, you're very unsure, you no longer can trust your judgment, you really don't know whether you've caused it, you, it's your fault, because these are all the put downs and the mm. um, verbal um, abuse that you, you, you mm. experience. So and you can look at someone like myself who is a career person and an articulate person and a strong person. So I always say that, you know, it, it, it can happen to anyone mm. and it, it really doesn't matter what profession you're in, whether it's, um, you know, high professional women, career women, po mm. politicians, any kind of woman is at risk. And um, and it, it, you are extremely confused and you, you really, you know, now I know that you never cause violence, never. It is a choice that the perpetrator makes. Mm. You, you can never nag too much or, or none of your behaviour is ever deserving of violent behaviour. No. And I think that's something that, you know, as your self-esteem is eroded away, you, you know, you do tend to blame yourself. And I think women are very good at blaming themselves. They blame themselves for, 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 for their, you know, for, for um, you know, that we have blaming natures and mm. take a lot of responsibility, I think, more than we should. I think the other thing too is that I wasn't very clear exactly what violence is. Uh, I was very clear that violence is when somebody physically hits you. Yes. But because Greg hadn't physically hit me, I don't feel back then I was really clear that he was being violent to me. So looking back, when you realised he was physically capable of hitting you. Mm. You've said on numerous occasions you never felt he would be violent to look. Yeah. But now in hindsight, do you think there's a correlation? Um, look, I think I would say now that if you're capable of being violent to an animal, to a pet, to a, a partner, to, mm. you know, you're capable of violence to anyone and anything, right. probably. Mm. Um, I... Greg adored Luke. He would he but when you're violent towards anybody around a child, it has psychological oh. ramifications to the child. I was very, very aware of that and always did what I could to kind of de-escalate situations. A lot of the um, but you know, it's living on a tightrope, it's living in a heightened state of stress all of the time. But Greg never ever lived with us and there was a, you know, many reasons for that. Um, so, you know, he adored Luke. He was very patient with Luke. He would do anything for him. But of course, when they're little, they're, you know, they're not challenging a parent. They, they're just little babies and they become toddlers. So, um, People would say to me, you know, why do you, you know, let Luke have access to his child, to his father? But you've got to remember that the law is actually sees that you know you no long, you have no more of an ownership of a child than the father mm. does, or the, you know, it's not that you own the child. The child is entitled to both parents. So, and my belief was that if he didn't know his dad, he would have other psychological issues. So I felt that it was more important for me to respect the relationship, to support the relationship and to try to manage it as best I could so that Greg and Luke could have a good bond, that Luke would know his father. And I used to say to Luke that, you know, you may not, you'll always love your dad and your dad will always love you, but you may not always like what he does. And maybe that's a bit too much for a child to understand, but I kept thinking that if I keep saying it, he, he will get that. Mm. Um, and so, um, you know, what I learned was that, and this is, you know, very typical of something that Greg would do, like he, he would just snap and I wouldn't even see it coming and I would not know what's triggered it invariably. And he may just come and aim several punches at my head and just stop that close. 
And then I'd think, did that just happen? What, what, what was that? And then I'd just think, you just leave, just go, get out, go. And he go, and you said that? Yeah, he, it, yeah, he did. Okay. Um, and then what would happen is I'd spend less time allowing him to come into my house or into my proximity. So there was an instance when Luke was about two where he did threaten to kill me if I ever stopped him seeing Luke. Right. So I was really clear mm. that, you know, he, he's von, he's, yeah, I was fear, I was fearful of standing up to Greg. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, when you see things about Greg, um, He's a, he, he was not an easy person to stand up to. And, and you have to ask yourself a question, if not in February, would he have found a way to do this at some point? Well, I think I couldn't believe, I'd known Greg for many, many years. He was very nonchalant about losing jobs. I mean, you know, obviously he probably was covering up a facade and a hurt, but he'd lost everything over the years. He'd lost everything and he, he, he could not have me. He could not regain a relationship with me and he could not have the life with him, me that he wanted. And he was living in a car and I was living in a nice house, um, with, which I've, I've been fortunate to be helped with because of my father. I worked, you know, I did, um, and, and all of those things. And his life was just not getting better, getting worse. And he, you know, clearly he, he had a lot of resentment and jealousy around the life I was able to give Luke and provide for Luke. And um, so I used to think to myself, I do not know how Greg keeps going. Really, I don't. You know, he'd be sat there and I'd think, oh. Um, and he would have a joke, you know. And so it was like I always expected that this is, it was always going to be like this. And... Um, and I, I really think that making him accountable and going through the court process really exacerbated the situation. It's a really difficult decision to make. Yeah, I can imagine. A really oh, difficult yeah. one because you don't know, you know, and I, I, I think people really, really underestimate that when you do do that, you're really, you're really liable to inflame yeah. a situation that you actually can't necessarily control. Yeah. and. You know, I, I, it took me a lot to actually start to go through this process because I was trying to manage it in a way that um, I felt was sustainable in a way that, you know, just we could just keep um, going on really. And, you know, Luke was maturing, he was getting, he was good. Um, he had his ups and downs, but generally speaking, he yes. was a happy kid. And you had no, absolutely no, on that night, you had no... You know, where we talk about women's Permission, intuition and nothing. No, and, and, and I suppose that's the unfortunate thing. You mm. know, with the systems that are in place, I didn't know that he'd, there were arrest warrants out for his arrest, that he'd mm. threatened to decapitate someone the week before. And, um, so I, you know, other departments knew about these things and counsellors, etc., but of course they didn't talk to each other. So these things were just yeah. not known. Yeah, because that would, if you had have heard that there was recent uh, situations, that would have changed the way you felt. Well, I think, you know, the, the, unfortunately, um, it's really difficult um, to really get a clear picture of what is happening because of privacy laws. And, and, and I think to a point, it's, it's up to the police discretion you're not entitled to know what else the perpetrator is actually doing. So as a victim, you don't necessarily have a complete picture of what they're doing if it's not directly involved with yourself. So again, that can be really difficult. It's very hard to understand how it would be yeah. unrelated. It's mm. very difficult yeah. to understand that. And I found that very confronting clearly when I yeah. found out there was a child pornography charge. Yes. Um, apparently that he'd been um, arrested I understand in, in like the November before, and Luke was having access to him and spending time with him until. Whereas if you'd known that, things would have well, been different at that point. Of course, point of because time. you think, well, would you let your son go out for the day trips with a, with somebody that you know they may not be guilty until you know innocent until found guilty? But I tell you what, you know, immediately I'm thinking, where's he taking him? Where, what's he showing him? Who's he talking to? Is he grooming him? You know. Yes. Yeah. Horrible thoughts, absolutely horrible thoughts, and 
here's a man where you think, I thought I knew the worst of him and now I've got this to deal with. So, you, you know, you, to not know is horrible when you are, you know, you have a child and you have a duty of care and you, you're clearly responsible and you're not yeah. going to let them go to some seedy place if they're yeah. looking at young children. I mean, who, who knows? Yeah. And I think, um, and then unfortunately, you know, there are, and, and the police have rectified some of the glitches in their system. Um, but ultimately, um, so how, when you say that they've rectified it, if how how would that be different for another family? Well, when I was going through my problems with Greg and trying to get him arrested, um, from leaving court with an arrest warrant, it would take up to three weeks for the police to have it on their system, so that other police knew. So there's and during that period of time, it's complicated because Greg is transient so he doesn't have a fixed address so they can't serve papers on him so ultimately it's all of this red tape that um, and, and so they have this um, if they can't serve papers it goes on to a and into their computer system but it before it's input in it can take a period of time because it sits on people's desks and goes here or there and everywhere and I don't know the full picture but ultimately that process now takes two days great so it's, it's definitely made a difference. It's made a difference. So yeah. that's the kind of black hole it used to go into, which is what contributed to the timing of Luke's death. It's, it, um, it is such a shame, isn't it, that invariably it takes a tragedy mm. to, to change mm. some of these things. Yeah. We are going to take a short break and then we'll be back with more with Rosie Batty. Luke had been injured, I thought it was a, an accident. I had no reason to think it was otherwise. Luke was the only bright light in his life. Family violence happens to everybody, no matter how nice your house is, how intelligent you are. No one loved Luke more than me. Welcome back. We're joined by Rosie Batty, who lost her son Luke to domestic violence. Rosie, uh, you know, the nation was very much with you that next mm. day after Luke was murdered. And all of us were ho wondering, how can you stand in front of the cameras? How, where did you get the strength? How, it was such an inspiration. What, yeah. what was going through your mind at the time? I don't think... Anything was, to be honest. <laughs> I think, you know, you'd like to have some... I think the reality is you are in shock. Yeah. That is the reality. You're totally numb. Mm. I think your body is an amazing instrument and it protects you. And I think that the enormity of what had happened, you know, you, you can't... It, you can't take it in. Mm. You know, you, you are numbed. So I'd gone to bed that morning, probably I got home from the police station by about five or six in the morning after giving statements. And I just crashed into bed. I was still in the same clothes. I, um, and, uh, you know, and I'd woken up and my house was full of friends and people. And I heard at some point, and I couldn't even tell you what time of day it was that I did go out to speak to the media. I, I really, I can remember doing it, but I couldn't tell you whether it was morning or night, because it was very hot. And I can remember hearing people talking about um, the media and they need to tell them to go away. And I found that people had started and continued to do so, making decisions on my behalf wow. because they were trying to protect me. And I was, I, Oh, that was the first instance where I was quite, a, you know, very assertive in that I, I've, I'm still capable of making decisions for my own, mm. um, for myself, and I felt if anyone was going to tell the media um, to go, it would have, it would be me. So they all kind of said, "Oh no, you can't go out," and I'm thinking, "Well, what is likely to happen to me? Yeah. You know, really, it's not like you know, realistically." So I did kind of go out there and. Um, with no agenda, no pre-thought plan, no pre-thought speech, nothing, um, just to nicely ask them to perhaps respect my privacy and go. And 
you know, when they asked me if I'd like to say a few words, I, I can't even quite remember. Um, I think they were all as surprised that um, I could articulate. Yes. And um, as I say, I think part of that is I am someone that talks a lot <laughs> normally. I think you are under shock. And when I look back, you know, the reason I was so calm, the reason I was so concise is because you are in shock and you, you really, your brain is not thinking quickly. Mm. And the reason I could articulate well was because I had studied family violence in my diploma. I knew the myths about family violence, the statistics of family violence. So somewhere from within, I was able to you say, drew on to drew on that. Yeah. And, um, and I've been really pleased that what I did say has really resonated mm. because I keep telling people that one in three women is affected by family violence. And that's a huge statistic. One in four children is affected by family violence. That's little boys, little girls growing up affected by family violence forever. You never ever recover completely. Mm. It, has an, it leaves an indelible mark on you. Mm. But the most damning statistic as well is that one woman a week is killed at the hands of family violence. Every week in Australia. In Australia, one woman a week. So when you look at that and if you, you know, and what, what is still incredulous to me is the general public still don't know that. The media no, don't know absolutely that. Absolutely not. So we know the de death tolls on our roads. We yes. hear about other tragedies and other society, um, you know, things. But why don't we know these statistics? Mm. Why is it that we are so, as a culture, it's like we're sweeping under the carpet? Yeah. And just why are we so ambivalent to this exist. huge problem? Mm. And mm. why is it that we have never really? been told about it or gone out of our way to learn about it and is it because we do assume that it happens to other people that it happens in rough neighborhoods and to others but not us yeah. and I think that was profound to people because what I was able to say and I can and I've been able to demonstrate it happens to all cross sections of the community mm. yeah. you can be famous you can be um, old, you can be young, you can be intelligent and you can be um, successful. You can live in nice neighbourhoods. It, it's everywhere. Yep. And, um, you know, there are so many people, so many women living with their kids in fear. And what you find is people are critical of the woman. They judge them constantly. They are judged by their families, they're judged by their friends, they're judged by the police, by the court systems, they are judged by everybody. Judge for what, Rosie? Because when I, when I listen to your story as a mum, mm. uh, I've got one of Luke's little, little oh, things to. on today, and I think you were gracious, I yes. think you were compassionate, I think you had look and only look mm. <sighs> in the forefront of your mind. I think you're the most selfless woman. And I find it incredibly difficult to think that people would judge because nobody knows what happens behind closed doors. No, and you the, made a choice for yourself. Yes, but the judgment is, again, um, why would I let Luke see Greg? Why would I support that relationship? Knowing all that you knew. Yeah, and, and, and yeah. so you've got either way, either way, the and whether it's not intended criticism, but it's mm. a questioning. Mm. You're questioning your role all of the time. Who the hell's going up to Greg and saying, hey, mate, why are you acting like that? Yeah. yeah. This isn't good enough. Yeah. Why are you not being made accountable for your actions? Mm. So I'm defending my decisions constantly to everybody. I'm yes. still doing that, actually. Really? Yeah, well, you know, through the court processes oh, yes. and, yeah. and things like that. But even still, if you go on any... Um, any newspaper articles that you see, um, um, whether it's positive ones with Ken Lay or you have a look at the opinions of people mm. and you see um, some really disparaging comments. Mm. People that don't understand how I could have let Luke die that night, how, how could I, you know, these are extreme. But what I will say is that as, as a victim of family violence, we are mostly judged and critiqued. Why didn't you leave? So but where do you fault. go to? Well, where, where do you leave to, Rosie? Where do you go? And, and, and 
what happens when a woman does run? Well, the whole thing is that's you know that is the the, the the logical answer. Where do you go? But of course, when people pose that kind of criticism at you, they don't have the solutions either. Mm. They just think, well, it's up to you to leave. The very fact that that places you at your greatest risk, where in fact, if you're going to be killed, that's likely to happen. If you are, if that is, unfortunately, the the worst thing that can happen. Mm. Um, but also separation doesn't end the violence. It just creates new ways of violence being able to be used against you. And that can be in the form of the court process, which is exactly what Greg did to me too. Um, it can be in the form of financial um, abuse. It can be, in, you know, in, in using the children to turn them against you. Um, but ultimately, um, where can you go when we look at the government's cutting down on all our resources and reducing safe places. We, mm. we do have refuges where you are safe for the time that you're in there. But then where do you go when housing is, is more, um, the cost of housing is, is, is out of reach of so many people? But it doesn't still mean you're going to be safe. So that, again, the onus of safety rests on you to either disappear and live an anonymous life or actually um, having to have false identities and move overseas, which is what the Women's Crisis Service help people to do all the time. So the perpetrator continues to live in their own neighbourhood, probably hold down their own job, continue to drink with their mates, do what they do. And the woman has had to uproot all her mm. network of friends, the children, you know, at the end of the day, my big, if I have a regret, and I don't think it's, there's much point in regret because you make the best decisions you can mm. with what you know at the time. But if I'd have had to move back to England, it would have been good on one hand because I was close to my family. But Lou wanted his, you know, he's at school, his sports, his clubs, his friendships, you know. It was all here. It was all here. And it's, and easy to, it's easy to say what you would do when you're not in this situation. Well, if you know that you're imminently, your life is threatened, you would do what you have to do. Yes. Sadly, not everyone has that warning. Mm. Mm. But it's, it's if you have the warning. And I suppose I look back at the history of violence with Greg and it was heading onto a collision course over the last 12 months. But no, did any of the professionals that were in your world in any way warn you that this is escalating, this is a problem? No, because unfortunately, um, uh, at this point with the the services I was linked into with my situation, no one joins those dots. So organisations work independently of each other. They look at minimal risk rather than the potential for the worst risk yeah. factors. They don't necessarily, they're not able to necessarily look at what might happen. They can only do something when something has happened. And unfortunately, my thoughts are that, you know, Greg was a violent man and I think when the police arrested him they could see his violence was escalating but what do you do with somebody you know our, our mental health system and our support for mental mm. health is grossly inadequate um, and and again I've learned only recently that you know, there was a description by one of the police that said of Greg he's bad not mad and I thought oh, you you know I, I'm quite clear he had mental health issues. I've, I've known him for 20 years and mm. I know he did. But of course, you can't force someone to have inter intervention. So what do you do with someone that does not engage with GPs, that does not... So he's never been actually diagnosed? No, and he's no. not going to, because he suffers from paranoia, he's yep. never going to actually go to um, seek help. Yeah. And so what do we do with these types of people? And what I've only just just recently learned is that certain types of personality disorders um, are deemed bad, not mad, and so are not covered under the Mental Health Act. And, and so, the, so I'm thinking, it's that's it's a really difficult situation. Yeah. And one of the things that, I mean, as Christy said before, we have been very inspired Thank by you. you watching the way that you've conducted yourself uh, in the public eye. Uh, has been very inspirational and very courageous and and um, you can see even you, from even from the small glimpses that we've had of look you can see yes. that yeah. he he yeah. very much is his mother's son yeah, and, and uh, very a, courageous so a great little spark yeah. he did yes. <laughs> he gave um 
gave his school a bit of a run for their money. <laughs> yeah, he did. And the thing is that his that his life continues through you mm, and yes. the Luke Batty Foundation and and all that you are doing now um, to to turn tragedy into triumph, mm. uh, hopefully for other people. What yeah. are your dreams and aspirations for the well, future? Well, look, I. Um, you know, I do feel very encouraged um, that through Luke's death, I think there's been a lot of... It's the first time it's it's on the political agenda. It's actually yes. being discussed openly a now. Victorian I think people are genuinely thinking, questioning statistics and, 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 and starting to understand violence. that it is far more of a serious problem mm. than anyone had ever realised. And that you're actually in a minority almost if you haven't had been affected or touched by family violence but you most definitely know of somebody that has or is and at this point there were you know there what I would really like to see is community attitudes changing so that we're actually holding perpetrators to account and actually challenging them with their behavior yeah. and in the meanwhile showing compassion and empathy and 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 um and assisting people who are living in... Um, how, how can we assist? I mean, I, I'm in a situation at the moment where I've met a very serious mm. situation, more serious than I've ever experienced before, where this person is fleeing for their life. And uh, they've experienced extreme um, violence to the point where they were unable to walk. And yet, this person is still not behind bars. Yeah. Um, how do we support the person? I think by not judging mm. um, and being a true friend by being a true, um, you know, just showing people that they care, that they believe them, that they don't judge them, that they know that they haven't caused mm. it. And they have a right and, and are deserving to live a safe and happy life. Yes. That yeah. should, it's a human rights issue, you know, mm. everybody mm. deserves to live. And I really think that, you know, if you have friends and family, um, you know, you need to make sure that they're linked into um, a family violence organisation um, who can give them the correct support um, and advice or, or um, assist them with the choices they can make because it is very, very complex mm. and, um, and it can be sometimes that they're... I just don't think, you know, they can, that safety can be guaranteed. Mm. And, um, and I think that, you know, the only organisations that really um, perhaps can really gauge the severity of that risk um, are, are family violence organisations. The police are doing an extremely good job and I know that they've got some good family violence units. So I think um, just to make sure that they're linked into a family violence network mm. and, and, and at, who can advocate with them mm. and go to the police and help them with that journey. That's good advice. And as for holding people accountable who are the yeah. perpetrators of violence, uh, that really should be the role of all society, I would think. I mean, if yeah. I knew of a man who was being mm. abusive in some way to his wife and threatening to his wife and children, um, I and other men around uh, would step in there and, yeah. and do what we can do. What would you suggest? Well, I do think it's, you know, it is a male issue. It is male, a male cultural problem and it is about men helping men to rebuild and change and instead of thinking it's not my business or well, he's a good bloke, I don't know, you know, he's a good bloke in other ways. When and he's with me, he's a good bloke. Yeah, yeah, or, you know, and also alcohol is not an excuse. Um, no. drug, you know, it, 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 violence is a choice. Alcohol doesn't help, drug addiction doesn't help, but it doesn't they cause violence. They would inflame, wouldn't they? But there's it a inflames, but here. it doesn't cause it. And I think that... Um, you know, and in the past, and it's understanding that there are many forms of abuse, that it's not just punching around having to get home from the pub, that it actually can be financial, it can be sexual, and it can be verbal. And so I think that quite a few of us have sometimes sat on the sidelines and thought, I don't like the way he handles his family. But you can have for a peaceful life, you try not to interfere. Um, yeah, so I think that, you know, it, that, that's not always an easy choice to make, but I do think that, you know, there are certain environments where, um, where you know, instead of choosing not to, to say something, perhaps you'd have an inner dialogue and consult with 
friends and family members and s start to say something yeah. and just say, in the end, mate, you're letting us all down. Yeah. That's not, that's mm. just not on. Yeah. Just finally, what's in the future for Rosie Batty? What would you like to see? Well, I'm, I really don't know. To be honest, I kind of don't look too far ahead because it still overwhelms me that Luke isn't in those plans. But um, I've got a trekking holiday booked in India um, and I'm hoping to go to America with a friend. So I'm, I'm looking at doing some things that um, are things I couldn't do and wouldn't want to do without Luke, but yeah. I can now do. But most importantly, um, the Luke Buddy Foundation, um, I'll continue to build that and look at what we do to continue to help women and children affected by violence. That gives me my meaning, my purpose, my direction. And I'm sure next year is going to be really a very busy year for me. Um, with, with what I've been doing and, and all the things I've learned that need to be done, um, there, there is a lot that I can be I can do. There is a lot I can do. And There's I'm certainly an awful lot in the area of education and awareness. Exactly. And that's my mm. probably the main area that I I feel I fit well with. Mm. And um, I've got some great colleagues in the family violence space now at the peak body level that I've I've you know, I, I speak with on a regular basis and I go to functions with and I have great trust and, and huge respect for them and I can see myself doing a lot of work with them into the future. That's mm. wonderful. Well, we wish you all the very best with, uh, with the thank work you. to come. Thank, and thank you for joining us on The Exchange. Pleasure. And thank you for watching. Please go to our website for a fact sheet as well as more information about this show. Hope you can join us next time. Bye for now.